And in the meantime, I would like to uh, invite and go to the next uh, presentation, invite our uh, second speaker. Uh, uh, we have for the second speaker, a very, we're privileged to have her with us. She has just come out of uh, COVID-19. And uh, when we were inviting her, we were nervous that she may not be able to join us. But now uh, we're lucky to have her with us. I'm speaking of no other than the uh, local chief executive of Quezon City, the biggest city in the NCR. And she's a public servant for nine years already. Recently, she was chosen as one of the top 10 outstanding mayors of the Philippines by the Gawad Filipino Awards. And prior to this, uh, she served as the vice mayor of Quezon City. At present, the Quezon City government already received various awards such as the Seal of Good Local Governance from the Department of Interior and Local Government, first place in the overall competitiveness and first Hall of Fame award from the Department of Trade and Tourism. This mayor also serves as the chief executive, as executive, sorry, uh, vice president of the League of Cities of the Philippines. She completed her high school at the Poveda Learning Center, got her social science degree from the Ateneo de Manila University, master's degree in philosophy, from the Institute of Archaeology, University College in London, and her master's degree in the Museum Studies from the Lister University in the UK. To talk about her experiences, local government leveraging cultural, social, economic imperatives in critical times, I'd like to call on the very active, very dynamic, but very lovely person, no less than the mayor of Quezon City, Mayor Josefina Joy Belmonte. Mayor, your, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ma'am Edna. Good morning to everyone who is here today listening to our uh, various lectures in the webinar. Thank you to Ma'am Costales. I am a uh, avid fan of urban gardening, so it was uh, nice to listen to your lecture. So my my talk today is um, called uh, "Well, Quezon City Countering the COVID-19 Pandemic," um, and it's a little bit of a simplified version, Ma'am, of of the topic that was assigned to me. Uh, next slide, please. So for the benefit of those who are not from Quezon City, just a short introduction. We are um, the largest city in terms of population in the Philippines with 3.1 million people. Uh, and third, in terms of land area, we have six congressional districts and the average age of a Q citizen is 24 years old. And we have slightly more women than men here in Quezon City. Next, please. So what is our COVID situation? Um, so, well, in terms of um, DOH confirmed cases, as of July 21, we had 14.1% of the total in NCR. I, I say that because that is quite significant because Quezon City comprises 25% of NCR, and yet we only have 14.1% or 0.1% of all the cases. No. In terms of active cases, we only have 8.64% of the active cases in NCR, also a good indication. Uh, in terms of recoveries, 22.9% of the recoveries in the NCR region, uh, which is also quite good. And this is the not so good news. We have 28.4% of the deaths in NCR, and I think we have to improve on taking care of uh, that aspect of uh, managing the pandemic. But overall, in terms of cases per million, uh, we are only 11th in the NCR, no? so not first, but 11th in terms of concentration. So in the uh, chart or bar graph, rather, next to this one, you will see that um, our recoveries exceed the number of our active cases, which is not true in many LGUs. So I think the strength of Quezon City is that we are very good in making sure that if you get sick, you recover uh, right away and quickly here in our city. Now, next slide, please. So in terms of our responses and challenges, next slide, please. Next slide, please. 
So um, I'm happy to say that uh, Quezon City was one of the very first cities to respond. As early as February, we already trained our barangay health and emergency response teams and our health workers and uh, distributed PPEs to them and taught them about COVID-19. So that was as early as February. As um, early as March 13, before ECQ was even in imposed, the Quezon City government already declared a state of calamity uh, in the city, and that enabled us to empower our 142 barangays to use their quick response fund, that is 30% of their disaster fund, in order to address the various concerns that are related to to COVID in their respective barangays. So we were the first no, to do that, and something I'm very, very proud to have decided on very quickly. Next, please. Next slide, please. Okay, so one of the challenges was, of course, feeding 4 million people. While we have 3.1 million people, we had a lot of um, uh, stranded individuals. No? So if we could go back to the previous slide, you will notice that we, uh, sorry, can I go back to the previous slide, please? Well, anyway, I, I already memorized the content of that. So we were able to distribute about 4.1 million food packs um, to our citizens. More or less, everyone was able to receive a food pack. And some of the challenges include house-to-house -house distribution, uh, making sure that everyone receives, given the, the vastness of our city, mobilizing enough people to give the distribution, et cetera. No. So in addition to the 4.1 million that we distributed during ECQ, we are still continuing to distribute. And we've distributed about uh, a couple of, of million other packs to the people who are in our lockdown areas. And later I will talk about that more. No? So we also had an aid a program in which we gave cash aid to our vulnerable sectors, 2,000 to the most vulnerable. These are the people who lost their jobs, the senior citizens, the solo parents, the lactating mothers, our scholars, our vendors, our transport sector, etc. And 4,000 people cash aid to all of the families who are in need but did not, distrib did not receive um, aid from the DSWD. Next slide, please. Can you go to the next slide, please? May we have the next slide, please? Next slide. I think that it's a bit stalled. Ah, okay, uh, sorry. The slide is stalled, so the technician is working on it. Well, I can continue with my um, lecture even without the slides, if you would like, ma'am. Yes, please. Yes, please. So, um, so we finished with cash aid, although sayang because nice to show the pictures. Um, uh, but uh, another aspect of our response is, of course, quarantine facilities. So again, Quezon City was the first to set up a quarantine facility as early as March, right after the declaration of ECQ. A week later, we were able to um, set up the first one. And now we have three quarantine facilities with 500 bid spaces. As you realize, uh, there has been a spike in the number of cases in recent days. So this has been um, quite unfortunate because our facilities have been overburdened. No? But uh, luckily, we also had the foresight to prepare. And so we are opening an additional uh, about 350 bed spaces by the this weekend. And by the end of uh, August, another thousand, I think. So well, another a uh, few hundred. So we will have a total of 1,400 bed spaces um, in Quezon City by the end of August for our quarantined um, pa uh, patients. No? So next, please. Uh, sorry, no slides. Um, so we also have expanded testing capacity. So this is one of the main uh, strategies of the local government to address COVID-19, to make sure everybody gets tested. And uh, so we're here with the quarantine facilities. And let's go to the next slide, please, which will show our testing capacity. 
So here, um, as you can see, we have a mobile testing uh, truck that goes around to our different communities. We have community-based testing in six districts in Quezon City. These are located in covered courts and in school premises. We also have hospital-based testing, and we have three um, government-owned hospitals that can test for you the Rosario Maclang Hospital in Batasan Hills, the Novaliches District Hospital in Novaliches um, proper, and in the Quezon City General Hospital no, in Project 8. We also do house-to-house -house testing, especially for our senior citizens and our vulnerable sectors. Next slide, please. So like I mentioned earlier, another strategy is called the special concern lockdown. So while the economy was opening up, there are areas that did exhibit uh, more positive cases, especially in our urban poor communities you know, where there was clustering. So what we do immediately when we notice that there is such a pattern is we lock down these communities. So we're not locking down barangays, we're locking down sitios, streets, compounds, small areas only. And then we do immediate testing in among all the individuals there and then um, if there are a lot of positives we they remain closed for another 14 days which is the period that is required by the DOH to uh, let the virus live out its its uh, course and if uh, needed if there are many many positives we lock down for as long as eight months and uh, eight, one month and uh, all of these people who are in lockdown areas are continuously given food aid uh, in order to prevent restlessness no and and uh, other forms of social unrest. So next, please. So another aspect of managing this pandemic was making sure that we were able to take care of the cadavers. No, um, This is a, a little morbid, but this is really essential in any crisis. So we were able to provide park freezer vans. We have about two in case that the hospitals are inundated with the deaths. Um, so these are uh, financed by the city. We also issued guidelines for all hospitals and funeral parlors to make sure that there is good coordination amongst them. We also passed an ordinance prohibiting from funeral parlors from uh, from uh, rejecting a COVID death. And uh, we also set up uh, very, very quickly a crematorium. And this crematorium can accommodate eight cadavers per day. Next, please. And uh, one other challenge, of course, and another uh, aspect of response is enforcing the physical distancing and quarantine protocols, which was the topic of our previous webinar. So we have since launched a campaign, which is the Why I Wear a Mask campaign. If you are from Quezon City, you will see these posters and tarpaulins all over the city uh, because it's an aggressive campaign to get everyone to wear a mask, uh, which will then limit transmission by as much as 70 to 80 percent. We have passed considerable numbers of legislation um, to ensure social distancing, prohibit mass gatherings, mandating mask wearing, regulating the sale and consumption of liquor, and imposing public safety hours. These are all, of course, in the IATF guidelines, but we wanted to add more teeth to these guidelines, so we made them into ordinances with penalties. We also issued localized guidelines, guidelines as well. These are actually called from the IATF guidelines, but are more detailed, and of course, cover all aspects of life, from transport to retail, to community living, to dining, to workplace uh, practices in the new normal. Next, please. And uh, here are some examples of our uh, means of enforcing physical distancing and quarantine protocols. We have spot checking teams that visit our restaurants and malls to, to see if they are uh, complying with our guidelines and protocols. We have installed a lot of CCTVs all over the city. So be very careful um, because the CCTVs are in places where you don't or you least expect them to be. We have surveillance teams on the streets. Um, and of course, we have our hotline 122. So if you as a normal citizen and see any violations, you can report them to the city for immediate action. Next, please. And of course, one of the things that we are very, very proud of is we have managed to um, have many, many programs to take care of our health workers who we value very much. So we have increased their pay. We've given them incentives uh, such as accommodations. Um, we also make sure that they are tested regularly. They are quarantined after two straight works of week, then they are quarantined for two straight works to make sure, two straight weeks to make sure that they are okay. We give them vitamins and uh, we provide further food and, and lodging. And we have also passed an anti-discrimination ordinance to protect our health workers um, as well as our COVID positive patients from discrimination, which happened a lot during the first few months of the pandemic. Next, please. 
And of course, we have expanded our contact tracing capabilities as per the orders of the national government. Quezon City now has hired 300 additional contact tracers. And um, um, we are trying to follow the, the model in Baguio City where for every positive case, they contact trace up to 37 individuals. So we are being guided by these um, guidelines that were given to us by Baguio City Mayor Benji Magalo. Next, please. So again, we provided Libreng Sakai, as you know, in the GCQ uh, and MECQ period, there were no buses allowed. So the city government entered into partnerships for, with our various uh, bus companies, and we were providing free transport services to our commuters. Now, apart from that, we also provided free shuttle services to all our health workers that would pick them up from the various accommodations we provided for them and bring them to the different hospitals where they work, whether this be public or private hospitals. Next, please. So I have to make this very, very fast. I know I just have a few more minutes left. So here, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about our recovery program. So while we are managing COVID, which is still ravaging us at this time, uh, we have to do recovery um, programs as well now. And also I'd like to discuss a little bit about that. Next, please. So we are now in the process of building 161 kilometers of interconnected bike lanes here in Quezon City. Um, next, please. So like Mam Costales, we are also embarking on a very highly developed food security program. I believe this is so important after what we experienced in the ECQ, MECQ, and even now where food is so important to our people and the sources of food uh, sometimes um, are a threat to our public health and, and safety. No? So we are doing uh, urban farming, aquaculture, agri-business. Agri now we're trying to grow some well, goats and rabbits, as Ma'am was saying, in some of our less densely populated uh, areas of the city. And also we have uh, uh, the nutrition program for our undernourished children. Next, please. So employment as well for the displaced is very, very important to us as well as for our entrepreneurs. So we have partnered with Lala Move and we have a program called Lala Jeep that gives employment to our jeepney drivers that have been displaced. We have a program with Food Panda called Panda Toda, which is again a delivery service that employs our Toda that have been displaced this place. We also have a partnership with Grab and Grab has employed some of our drivers and some of our food entrepreneurs are also on Grab. And I have not put it here, but Lazada has also partnered with the city government so that our entrepreneurs can sell their products online. Next, please. We also have allocated a $1 billion uh, stimulus package, or this is a wage subsidy package for our micro and small entrepreneurs. So how this works is we want to make sure your business doesn't close and that your employees continue to have jobs. So we will pay half of the salaries of your employees for a total of three months. Um, and this is just to make sure that your businesses continue to thrive in these difficult times. And uh, so far, we have uh, about uh, 500 to 600 already in the program. Next, please. So again, another way that we're helping our entrepreneurs is to help them sell online. So we are publishing a catalog. This will be distributed widely, especially to our uh, this, uh, our various uh, big corporations no? so that they can patron, patron, patronize some of the local products being produced by our home-based entrepreneurs. No? And they can be delivered these products through online services. Next, please. And then we have also passed legislation to waive all penalties and interest to taxpayers who are unable to pay business taxes for the first to third quarters of this year. So, um, wala na po silang mga penalties na babayaran. No? Uh, and that's our way of helping our, our business owners as well. Next, please. And of course, we are transitioning to full online engagements with the city government. So now you can pay your taxes online. You can uh, get legal advice online. You can process permits online. And you can apply for your PWD and senior citizen ID online. Next, please. And of course, as a gender um, advocate, rights advocate, I noticed that there are a lot of domestic violence that occurred during the ECQ where, where women and children were stuck at home with possibly their perpetrators. So um, we saw the numbers skyrocket during this period and we have uh, 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 put up not only a protection center, but now we're putting up a shelter as well for all victims of gender-based violence as well as uh, children who have been victims of violence and abuse in their uh, communities. So next, please. 
So um, we have received millions. I have to say this because you really, you know, our success in Quezon City or our our response here in Quezon City would not have been made possible without the millions of pesos in cash and in kind that we received from the private sector, from our embassies, uh, from our diplomats, from um, well-meaning individuals. Um, we received thousands, literally, of contributions and aid from them. And in fact, now we are building our own molecular laboratory. This is, again, a donation from the private sector. Sector. All of our quarantine facilities were made possible because of donations from the private sector. And so the private sector for me is key to the success of our endeavor endeavors here. So next, please. So lessons learned, I'll go through this very, very quickly. Number one, I believe there is a need for better coordination between the national government and local governments. This, this for me is very important. While we, we do have meetings with the national government on a regular basis, and that, that have, those have been very, very helpful, still there are some aspects. For example, uh, the OFWs coming into our city, a lot of them uh, we, we um, just discovered have been staying in our various hotels, and we have not been told by the OWA or the Bureau of Quarantine. So nagugulat na lang kami na may balitang may tumatakas na mga COVID positive patients sa ating mga um, hotels. And then we find out na marami pala sila doon sa mga hotels natin naka-quarantine at hindi kami sinasabihan. So hindi namin nabibigyan ng sapat na security. Hindi namin na nakakollect yung mga garbage nila. Nakailangan iba ang, ang methods of collection. Hindi natin napapangalagaan yung mga workers na nandun sa mga hotels na yan. And I would hope for more and better coordination in the days to come. Number two, government must always practice transparency, especially in disclosing facts and figures because the basis of a healthy relationship between the people and the government is trust. Here in Quezon City, that is my mantra. Transparency, kaya mataas ang bilang, kaya mababa ang bilang. Kung nagkakaproblema tayo, kulang ang space, uh, ubus na ang bed spaces sa hospitals, etc. I never make up stories. I never say everything is okay. I always say, we have a problem. Um, people of Quezon City, let's help each other. Let's understand one another. But trust is so important and trust is comes from honesty. Next is government must implement a citywide identification system with digital features to ensure swift, efficient, and accurate distribution of aid. And uh, that is something we are launching now in the next three months, the cute citizen ID card, because we realize that things would have would have been so much easier for us if every citizen from Quezon City had an ID card uh, in terms of distributing, di distributing aid, in terms of identifying who needs aid more. Um, all could have been much easier done with an identification card. And this is something we're going to be doing. And of course, copied from uh, my good friend, uh, Mayor Abibina in Makati, who has a Makati citizen card already. Next, please. Um, there is a need to maximize the use of technology in all aspects of pandemic management, especially in data analytics. And as much as possible, decisions must be data driven. So for me, it's Hindi pwedeng naguhula lang tayo. Hindi, we cannot be inventing our decisions. We cannot be uh, making decisions off the bat. We have to base all our decisions on data. And that's something we're proud of. Though, because from the beginning, um, everything has been um, well recorded, well documented. And then we have um, technologists and analysts working with us to make sure that all the data that is presented to me is accurate. And um, all the decisions I make as the local chief executive are all based on data. Next is government must succeed or cannot succeed without private sector participation. I already mentioned that. Again, the success of Quezon City, I, I, and I attribute that wholly to the participation and concern and the contributions and donations and assistance given to us by the private sector. And next is quick, decisive, and proactive decision making is key. So again, I never, here in Quezon City, we try not to wait. Uh, if we think that something has to be done, even when there are no instructions yet from the top, we already do them. And then later, I just um, make paalam or tell the DILG or the IATF that, uh, you know, we had to make this decision right away because here are the data um, uh, that are, this is what the data, the data is telling us and the data is telling us we have to act quickly. And last is teamwork and multitasking is essential. So I have uh, 30 seconds to say that this is for me so important um, in government. 
uh, it's so people always want to use titles. I am the boss. These are my subordinates, etc. But I told the team here in Quezon City that during the pandemic, uh, there are no bosses, there are no subordinates. We're all equal here. We're all public servants. We all have to serve um, essentially in the same manner. Uh, we all have to multitask. We all have to do things that we normally don't do because uh, there is no room for pride in a pandemic. Everybody must work because all ha hands must be on deck. So um, thank you very much, Ma'am Edna, and uh, given, thank you for the opportunity you've given to me to share again uh, the experiences here in Quezon City. Well, uh, we should actually be the one thanking you, Mayor Joy, for sharing us uh, the very rich uh, experience of governance. Indeed, governance is always, and it has to be multi, interdisciplinary. Everyone contributes pitches in into the whole. I think this is a wonderful experience you're sharing. And it also locates how scientists could come in in the context of how we can perform our work in the governance, uh, being data-driven, putting in expertise and doing teamwork alongside everyone in the city. I think this is a very challenging job, but uh, you have uh, shown that in a few, uh, in the initial year of your term and with so short a time, everyone seems to be uh, moving and everyone seems to be acted upon. So thank you again. But uh, again, I, I call on some questions and comments uh, for, uh, for uh, to hold them for later during the Q&A. Thank you so much again, uh, Mayor Joy Belmonte.